Hi everybody, Paul McFarlane here again with another little tidbit from the world of Shiat Day. From the Rizzoli book, and if you don't have a copy of this, you can still get one sometimes on eBay or whatever. But um, what I'm going to do today is actually read something <clears throat> that is so wonderful. The wonderful, wonderful world of advertising and how it can be sometimes. <clears throat> I'm going to be reading this. Stephen Kessler, again, who wrote this, or, you know, recorded it. <clears throat> this is about the New York office in 1982, pitching a really big account, one that would make the office at that time. And I want you to sit back and relax and get your popcorn and listen to this. This is the best of what advertising can be. It rarely is, so I want you all. I want you all. In fact, even my wonderful friends at Mischief, who are riding the wave of their second year, they can do no wrong, and everyone's looking at them. Remember, to do that over five years, 10 years, 20 years is a completely different thing. So stay inspired. Listen to this. It is December in New York, two weeks before Christmas. As the year winds down, America's thirst for melon drinks is subsiding, and Shiat Day in New York finds its back against the wall. Two and a half years, and they still haven't won the kind of account that makes people think they're going to be staying for a while. They are invited to pitch the $10 million Holland America Cruise Line account. $10 million in 1982. Yeah, does it make sense now? Twelve... Twelve <laughs> agencies have been invited to pitch. We would find that unreasonable, and someone would be writing on LinkedIn about how we got to change the system, and if you're asking 12, you don't know what you want, and so don't work for them. Hmm. Holland America lays the ground rules of the pitch. The agencies are to, are to make three presentations. The first will be credentials. Several agencies will be eliminated. The second one will be understanding of the marketplace. Then more agencies will be eliminated. The third presentation will be the strategy, positioning, and creative work. Then an agency will be chosen. So again, you're an agency trying to make a foothold in your, you know, some of your accounts are kind of going away. You're back up against the wall. You got to go for it. It's you against 11 other agencies. Probably a lot of them are much better known in that city, much bigger, whatever. What would you do? Well, back to our story. Jay, an account guy, and the creative director go to the first presentation. They get by that one, and soon they get a call letting them, telling them that there are now five agencies left including two of the biggest, oldest advertising agencies in New York. The thought of competing with agencies that size is not a pretty one. Now think, why did the client say that? In case you would be scared off by that, quit now, pull out. Saves us a little bit of work. I respect him for doing that, but back to our story. <laughs> Jay gets together with the people working on the pitch, which is just about everybody in the shop, and says this. Personally, I think we can have a great second meeting. I don't know what the hell we're going to do at a third meeting. I mean, what do you do? Nobody else knows either. He says, why don't we do this? Let's do the third meeting at the second meeting. Do all the strategy, all the positioning, everything at the second meeting. We'll do all the things that we're supposed to be doing at the second meeting, but we'll have everything else ready. Well, everybody, everybody is working on this presentation. They do all the ads. In fact, <laughs> they don't want Holland America to know that. So their thing is, 
They're not going to draw a magic marker. They're just going to draw magic marker ad ideas during the presentation, like the ads are a natural extension of the discussion. They're cheating. Well, in the best way. <laughs> so in other words, they develop all the ads, but they say, well, let's do this. Let's develop the ads. And then in the meeting, in the presentation, do some flip charts and just start saying, hey, a headline like this, a headline like this. <laughs> right? So the real genius appears to be spontaneous you love this I love this the presentation comes and as the meeting progresses the walls of the room are slowly covered with these pages and pages of great ideas that seem to just keep coming being drawn up as fast as the shy a day team can think of them the meeting ends politely with a promise that Jay will be called soon one way or the other Now it's Friday, and Christmas is approaching. The finals, if they make them, are scheduled for the first week in January, which will mean working straight through the holidays. It gives people mixed emotions about even wanting to still be in the pitch. Late in the afternoon, Jay gets the phone call. He sends out his assistant to gather everyone in the conference room. He's talking to Holland America, she tells them, and she doesn't look too happy. Everybody who works in that office, which is maybe 20 people tops, is sitting there for 10, 15 minutes. Then Jay comes strolling in. In Jay's way. He's got this dour look on his face, and he's talking real quiet. Uh, he would kind of talk like that. You know, right? So quiet you can hardly hear him. He says, well, we got the phone call, and they said that... Uh, they looked at all five presentations and they were trying to figure out who should be in the finals and they know that the work is going to be have to be done over the holidays and they feel really bad about doing that. So they decided one of the presentations was really so outstanding. They're not going to have the third meeting. They're just going to give out the account. And they decided to give the account to shy a day. <laughs> they start to party and they keep going for three days straight. Oh, postscript. A few months into the near, new year, Jay gets a call from Guy. I'm getting bored at home. You need my help? Guy asks, and Jay says, when can you start? Sorry about that. All right, so what is this story about? This story is about the romance of advertising. And I was talking to someone earlier today in Clubhouse about what does it mean to be... Uh, an underdog. Well, the thing is, an underdog means that there's more than two. You've got to be called an underdog or thought of as an underdog in a greater field. So whoever you are watching this, if you feel that you are an underdog or called one in any competitive situation, even the competition of standing out on LinkedIn, remember, when you're an underdog, the rule book goes out the window. Just Go for it. Do what the big places can't do. If they ask for credentials, show ideas. If they ask for roughs, show them finish. If they ask for a newspaper or print or digital, make a movie. Pitch to where they're going to be. Show that you are so smart and so fast and ready to go. That's what you show. That's what Jay figured out. Jay had balls of steel and had the guts of iron. And when he realized the agency needed it, he could have been careful. He could have retreated away. He could have bowed out of the, of the pitch. He would have said, we can't possibly compete. But no, no. He was audacious. And now your favorite agency, whoever it is, like I said, Mischief, I love them, and they work very quickly, and they just, you know, go for it, and that's kind of what we're talking about here. But a lot of times, these days, accounts are just handed. There aren't competitive pitches as much as there used to be, and that could be going away. But even if you're trying to compete for attention with a client, if you're trying to compete at the tension for a job, for anything you want to do, don't be logical. Go for it, be audacious, and go the extra mile before 
the race even begins. Shiat fucking day. Today, we need that. Don't you agree?